Hi. So I'm on the floor. Over the weekend, I've been painting my room. Polished pebble. So I'm on the floor. Got my hot water bottle, cause it's a cold. And I'm next to the window. And my coffee. Now, it's time for my opinion. I see many single Christians not knowing how to navigate their singleness. I see them instead feeling inadequate to their married friends. Because unfortunately, what seems to have happened in the church, at least often, is that marriage is elevated above singleness. Both are adequate, equal ways to glorify God. And that's the principal purpose of both. In fact, of anything and everything we do. I also see that in Christian speech, we have lessened the implication of fornication as a sin by referring to it using this new term, premarital sex. Premarital infers that the kind of sex you have outside of marriage, or even the kind of sex that you may have with another person other than your spouse, if you are married, adultery, is the same kind of sex that you have in the union of marriage. Also giving the impression that if you'll just wait, God will give you that partner you can get jiggy with, as if that's his big plan for you. There's too much emphasis on having sex, which would be fine if there was just as much teaching, encouragement in, in having knowledge and understanding on the subject. But there seems to be a lack of good, honest, in-depth teaching on sex and on marriage and why sex outside of marriage is not good, why marriage is good, what marriage is for, whether or not a person has the grace to remain single, and if so, should they? What's sex? What's its purpose? You know, all that good stuff. So I see Christians who don't understand why sex outside of marriage is wrong, or why it's not good for them. And you know what? It isn't their fault. Because when you have hormonal teenage Christians with no grounded sex education, or you have newcomers to the faith, people who profess faith later in life, who have come from living worldly lives, building those habits that, according to the culture of the world, are perfectly fine and normal and good and great. For them, there seems to be little to, to no attention, no education given. It's as if they're, they're basically told, whether indirectly or directly, you're a Christian now, so forget everything else you knew, that's all sin. Be holy, just cause. I've actually personally experienced many single mothers in the church who feel neglected who feel as though people think that they're kind of done, you know, they're, in terms of their romantic life, it's over. They're not being poured into, they're not being taken care of, they're not being considered. Where is all the, you know, the, the, the drive for married people to look at their Christian brothers and sisters who are single and think, hmm, you know, they might really suit this person. Now, don't get me wrong, everyone has their own personal responsibility to studying the word and getting to know what it is that they believe, but also we are a community, we do fellowship, and we do have a responsibility for one another. We are our brother's keeper. And just to emphasize, single mothers in the church, men, whether you're married or single, your interactions with every woman don't have to have a sexual connotation. Like, you were made to be fathers and brothers, whether you actually father children or are a physical, biological brother. It's the nature of who you are as a man, and women need you. So step up. If you see single mothers in your church, or single women in general, talk to them. 
see how they're doing how is their spiritual life how are they emotionally do they need anything is there any practical way you might be able to help them are they dating anyone give them some godly counsel as a man all right opinion over the word fornication is almost completely gone from contemporary Christian speech because, let's be real, over the years it's assumed some creepy connotations. We prefer to talk about premarital sex. And, you know, using your discernment, using tact is excellent. And when you're in conversation with someone, you, you really want that person to feel loved. You don't want them to feel condemned. We need social skills. We need to learn how to talk to people. That's good. So choosing to use one word over another might be a strategic thing to do out of love for that person. Sometimes words can trigger to an extent. Scripture talks, mentions fornication, and we ought to know why and what sex and sexuality means to God. The loss of such a word from Christian dialogue gives the moral imagination up to the sexual revolutions of the culture. Fornication is both spiritually and typologically a different kind of act from the marital act. That's why the consequences are so dire. We think they're disproportionate sometimes because we think that fornication is simply a premarital jig. Fornication isn't premarital. That would infer that it is simply the good godly marital act misfired at the wrong time. Sex forms a very real spiritual union. As the Apostle Paul warns, sex without the covenantal bond is a union, but with a different spirit than the spirit of Christ. The language of premarital sex can cause the conscience to evade responsibility and accountability, to ultimately evade turning away from that thing, repentance. Because if the problem was timing or waiting, having patience, then the problem would be resolved once you're married. But marriage isn't the solution to fornication. It's not the solution to lust. Is your libido stronger than your conscience? Is your sex lust stronger than your love for Christ. If you're able to justify your own fornication, you'll just as well justify adultery, porn addiction. If you're addicted to porn, getting married won't solve your problem. You'll just bring that problem into your marriage because the problem isn't that you have natural sexual desire. The problem is a sexual immorality. It's a twisted desire. It's important to discern lust from natural, good, godly sexual desire. The biblical definition of lust is a strong craving or desire, often of a sexual nature. The word is never used in a positive context. It's always seen in a negative light, relating to either a strong desire for sexual immorality or for idolatry. In the Old Testament, the word is primarily used to describe idolatrous worship. In the New Testament, it almost exclusively refers to sexual immorality. Sexual desire in itself is good. God made it good in the beginning. It was made to be guided by two things, honor towards the other person and holiness towards God. Lust is what that sexual desire becomes when honor and holiness are missing. God established a relationship called marriage. A man and a woman make a lifelong covenant to honor one another with faithfulness and with love sexual desire becomes the servant and the spice of that covenant. To say to another person, I want you to satisfy my sexual desire. I know people don't talk like that. We're not robots. I'm not a robot. Me, work. To say to another person, I want you to satisfy my sexual desire, but I do not want to covenant with you, basically means I want to use your body for my own sexual pleasure. But as a whole person, I don't want you. And that is dishonoring and therefore lustful. Knowing God and acting like it keeps sexual desire from becoming lust. Therefore, whoever disregards this, the call for holiness, disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Holiness is living in supreme regard for a holy God. Lust is the opposite. 
God created sex and sexuality good and beautiful. So it's healthy for a single person to have sexual desire. Don't be fooled into condemnation, whether you're fooling yourself or allowing yourself to be fooled by others. Since God created sex and sexuality for the good of his creatures, he alone has the wisdom and the right to show us how to use it for his glory and for our own good. To summarize, lust is a sexual desire that dishonors the object and disregards God. It's the corruption of a good thing. If your sexual desire is not guided by respect, by honor for the other person and regard for the holiness of God, it's lust. Moving on. Is marriage the solution for lust? Each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Do not deprive one another. If they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. If we read this passage as the purpose for marriage, we read it incompletely and incorrectly. Paul is using truths about marriage to make his point, such as because of the temptation to sexual immorality, it's better for each man to have his own wife and for each woman to have her own husband. And that because of the temptation to sexual immorality, it's better for people to marry where they can express their passion rather than to remain single and burn with it. But the focus of the chapter is not marriage. Paul gives this truth as a concession not as a commandment. If marriage is the focus of this passage, and if Paul is sharing the principles of marriage, then the whole second half of the chapter doesn't make sense because he goes on to say things like, men who have wives should live as if they have none. The passage isn't about marriage, homeboys and homegirls. And marriage, marriage is not the solution to lust because the problem with lust isn't that we don't have a place to express it. So does that mean marriage doesn't help? with lust? No, that would be ridiculous. Of course it helps. It puts everything into the proper context. It gives us the opportunity to satisfy sexual desires and have intimacy as God designed. But if your problem is lust, it doesn't solve it. The solution to lust is undivided devotion to God. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is about. And if we read it that way, everything else falls into its proper perspective. So let's do that from verses 29 to 35. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Given the proper context of this passage, we see ways to secure our undivided devotion to the Lord. And the passage lines up with what Jesus said. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. When our love for marital intimacy and sexual fulfillment is greater than our love for Jesus, we have misplaced loves. It takes on a form of idolatry. Same thing as lust. When our desire for lesser loves is so strong that we burn with passion, we shouldn't try to suppress or eliminate that desire. The lesser love isn't wrong. That passion, that burning, should motivate us to cultivate a greater desire for Jesus and the things of God. Sexual desire, sexual energy is made for more than sex, more than pleasure and procreation. It's a catalyst. It's to inspire creativity, leadership, passion for God, passion for people, spiritual warfare. The hormones that arouse you sexually also arouse your creativity gives boldness in leadership. God physically designed us to be all about making his name famous through art, 
through business, in education, in ministry, and whatever else. What injustice makes you angry? Do something about it. Don't be apathetic. What dream constantly occupies your mind? Pursue it. Our needs for sexual and emotional intimacy are not perfectly satisfied in marriage. God created us to desire something more. Your ultimate desire should not be to find a spouse. You're missing the point. God created us to want something more, something heavenly, something we're still waiting for, married or unmarried. All our energies ought to be channeled for that single purpose as the body of Christ. If being married helps us to do that more completely, with more complete devotion, because we're not distracted, let them marry. If remaining single allows us to do so, remain as they are. Marriage isn't so much finding a place to satisfy your desires. It's about helping us to channel those passions to greater loves. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Whether you struggle with pornography, romance novels, or fantasizing about a particular person, whatever, use your sexual energies to accomplish things for God. It's not impossible, we're dynamic. Your sexual energy isn't made for just one place. Make Jesus your focus. Idleness, passiveness, these things, they're not your friends. In any situation, the problem of lust will dissipate as your desire for God explodes. We need passion in this world. We need men and women who live from a deep, God-centered passion with unwavering commitment to the glory of God. I think young people, all people today, need to know that we're made for more than sexual gratification. That's something that has been elevated so high in our culture, increasingly so. Far too often, we settle for the lesser love, the lesser love of sexual fulfillment, when we're made to be image bearers of God's glory. If marriage is included in the path God has for you, then sexual fulfillment is a part of that. But our focus should not be on sexual fulfillment. Married Christians love telling single people why they can't have sex. Love telling young people, wait, don't do it. Single people are then left navigating their sexual desires with very little guidance. Something that is good and holy. Thinking it's a burden. Thinking they must not be good enough. Not holy enough. Not strong enough. Because they're struggling. All of this neglect and lack of proper teaching, which comes often by being too comfortable in your own marriage, leads people to experience and maybe express twisted and sinful distortions of the desire in their hearts and in their bodies. Each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Asking unmarried singles to control their sexual impulses for longer and longer periods of time is a fairly new phenomenon in our culture. This has been brought about by an earlier age onset of puberty combined with later age marriages. Some dating couples will abuse 1 Corinthians 7 and use it to rush in lust instead of taking wise steps out of love for God and neighbor. Struggling, unhealthy couples will steal better to marry to excuse their destructive relationships and toxic behaviors, and then to burn with passion to make that which is sinful good and natural. The sexual desire of the unmarried person is good. It's holy. What does it mean to burn? To burn with passion? Is marriage the coveted arena where all your sexual fantasies come to life? Is marriage a crude medium to satiate your carnal desires, that which disgusts God? Is it an inconvenient reality to burn with passion that both God and man must endure till death, shamefully? No, for Paul it's legitimate sexual desire among the unmarried. He states his audience clearly, the unmarried and the widows. Sinful sexual desires aren't regular and good, and marriage isn't meant to be this unrestricted place for our unhindered sexual whims. The Christian sexual ethic requires 
love thy neighbour, applied to the context of marriage. Love the spouse above oneself. It is against abusive relationships. Mutual consent, healing, concern for the other, these are necessary aspects of a Christ-honouring sexual relationship. It would seem backwards then for Paul to advocate entering such a godly relationship for selfish reasons, burning with passion, unless that burning is legit and holy. Unique gifts like singleness, like speaking in tongues, are graces. The gift, the grace of singleness isn't given to all people. For some, to attempt to live a life of singleness without being called or gifted is to try accomplish a ministry for which God has not resourced you, hence the burning. If you cannot exercise control, it doesn't mean you should suppress your desires. It doesn't mean you should stay single until you desire no more, if that day comes. It means if the right things are in place, a spouse would be a great help to you. Is a person who engages in premarital sex married, whether with one person or multiple partners, since they had the one flesh relation? A sexual encounter by itself does not constitute marriage. If a person engages in sex before marriage, the person commits the sin of fornication, while a married person who cheats on their spouse commits adultery. Neither fornication nor adultery are equal to marriage. In fact, they are sins because they are acts conducted outside of marriage. The biblical definition for marriage is this. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Marriage relationship involves a forsaking of the parent relationships, the entering into marriage covenant, and sexual union. If sexual union takes place without the first two components, then the relationship is not a marriage. So that's three things. A man must leave his father and his mother. The Hebrew word translated leave literally means to forsake or to abandon, which says a man must transfer his personal allegiance from his parents to his bride. Before a man takes a wife, his strongest human commitment is to his parents. God tells us to honour mother and father. So an unmarried man's relationship with his parents takes precedence of every other relationship. Earthly relationship. Once a man marries, his allegiance to his parents must become secondary to his allegiance to his wife. The process of leaving one's parents and cleaving to one another typically includes a lifestyle change an authority change, and a heart commitment. Recognising that this relationship takes priority over all other relationships. When we engage in casual sex, there is no intention to transfer allegiance. Even if some degree of commitment is expressed, it's unlikely that the relationship will take precedence over parents or friends. Second, the man will be joined to his wife. The Hebrew word for joined means to cleave, to remain steadfast. It describes a relationship that is inseparable. What God has joined together, let no man separate. Just as the physical relationship between a parent and a child can never cease, similarly, a marriage relationship will never cease until death. A true marriage requires this lifelong commitment and this commitment is expressed through a marriage covenant ceremony. While the ceremony itself can vary, the purpose is always the same. It gives the couple an opportunity to make that lifelong pledge. Couples who enter into a marriage covenant communicate their commitment by exchanging rings, vows publicly, signing legal documents, changing their names, calling each other husband and wife. The purpose of these things is to clearly communicate that that man and that woman acknowledge their respective participation in the covenant. Casual sexual relationships, even long-term relationships, are not equal to marriage. They lack the necessary formality of a personal pledge and lifelong commitment. They lack the signs and symbols of a covenant, of a marriage. And more importantly, the couple themselves lack the perspective of being married. If someone asked them to describe their relationship, they'd say something like, we're dating, we're just friends. Third and final, a 
true marriage requires the couple to become one flesh. There's an expectation to consummate the marriage. Though all sexual encounters establish that one flesh union, not every one flesh union is equal to that which is made within marriage, since the relationship lacks the other biblical components. Our bodies signify the obvious. The two will become one flesh. Sexuality is a deeply spiritual and soteriological reality. Your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit within you. God has created ordinances and means of grace for his church, for restoration, for healing. We're not dirty and sinful for our sexual desires. And God fights for us as creatures made in his image with those sexual desires. While Satan fights against us as image bearers of God with sexual desires, we have a high priest who helps us even as we wrestle with sin so that we might hold fast to our confession, who guides us along the way in wisdom and power. My name is Christ Defender. I defend the Christian faith. I answer questions and criticisms concerning Christianity. If you like what I do and you would like to support me, hit the Patreon link in the description below. If you're not too sure yet, but you're intrigued, hit subscribe, turn on notifications, check me out. Okay, bye.